Yep, my microphone went out. <laughs> but anyway, take it away, Connie. All right, thank you, Phil. Well, today I'm going to talk a little bit about soybean cyst nematode, often called like the silent yield robber. The reason that that, that is why we call it that is due to the declining yields that occur due to SCN damage. You know, SCN alone can cause $1.5 billion damage and yield loss here in the United States. You know, SCN not only does the declining yields, but, you know, robs nutrients of the plants, causes stunting and dwarfing of plant roots. It reduces the numbers and the efficiency of the nitrogen fixing nodules and also provides wounds for pathogens to enter, such as sudden death syndrome and brown stem rot. So what does SCN look like? Well, SCN is a microscopic unsegmented roundworm, as you kind of see here on the first slide on the roots. The nitrogen fixing nodules are a larger shape on the root where in the SCN is a very small shape, but we'll get more into that. Um, SCN is the most important soybean pest in the United States and in the world. Again, the US alone, it causes over one and a half billion dollars guild loss. So imagine if we looked at the loss across the world, it'd be, it could be quite significant. Anyhow, where we say we get the silent yield robber mentality is that oftentimes when you pull up to a field, you're not gonna see very many symptoms until the SCN numbers get very advanced. You know, oftentimes you're gonna receive a 10 to 30% yield loss and you're not gonna see any symptoms. The plants are gonna look green, healthy, uniform. You know, you got that nice canopy closure, but they just aren't yielding as well or you start to see a little bit of loss throughout the field. Oftentimes when the the SCN goes unmanaged in those acres and you start to have a high buildup of SCN, you could have between a 30 to 70% yield loss. So it can be quite drastic for your soybean fields. Where's SCN and when did we first find it in South Dakota? SCN was first identified in 1995 down in Union County. Since then, it has progressed to 34 different counties here in the state, you know, all along that eastern part of the state where we grow a lot of soybeans, you know, from north to south. Does it mean that the counties that show white don't have SCN? Not necessarily. It's just we haven't come across that field or that sample because, again, you're not going to see those symptoms when that SCN level is low out in the field. So we really encourage people to be on the lookout for SCN and soil sample, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. So again, it has really progressed within the state. So it's not new as a pest here, but it's one that we need to continually work with and try to try to manage. So again, SCN, when you pull up to that field, everything looks good. You know, that nice uniform canopy, the nice green cover, the night, you know, it's nice and closed. Things are looking like it's yielding pretty good. But parts of the field had a little bit of a yield drag, right, as the harvest was occurring. Well, as in looking at when you carefully dig up those roots, you can find the female cyst on those roots. Again, this is between that 10 to 30 percent yield loss out in the field when SCN gets a little bit more drastic, when you start to see some symptoms out there, you can have that 30 to 70% yield loss. So it can have quite that devastating effect. You know, oftentimes you're gonna see some stunted plants, some yellowing, some open canopy, often found in the lower parts of the field, you know, wet areas along the fence rows or even the entrance of the field is where you often would want to target to look for SCN. So as you're kind of thinking and asking, how can something so small cause such a problem? Well, as we take a look at the life cycle for SCN, there's three phases of the life cycle. We have the egg, we have the juveniles, and then we have the adult. 
the eggs and juveniles are pretty microscopic. Again, you're not going to see them by just moving soil. You'd have to look for those cysts on those roots of the plant. Within the juveniles, there's four different stages that do occur. But anyhow, when we take the egg, within that egg, the first juvenile will molt within the egg. So it de develops within that egg, molts, and then the J2 or the second stage of a juvenile is hatched from the egg. And that's the one that we say is the mobile one that penetrates and enters into the soybean cyst root. That J2 is attracted to the roots, it penetrates, you know, it gets inside, wants inside, it injects some secretions that transform it to be a feeding site for SCN, and that's called a synthesium. Anyhow, the juveniles will continue to feed, they start to swell, start to enlarge in, and we kind of come sausage shaped. As you can kind of see in the center of the soybean root here on the screen, they will molt three times before they become or turn into an adult nematode. If they're a male, their last molt, they become slender and modal with that last molt. So females, they become lemon shaped and they become so, oh, let's just back up. With the, with the males again, so they're gonna be that slender mo mobile site. What they will do is with that last molt, you know, they'll start to, they'll stop feeding within the plant. They mate with the females and then they migrate or they leave the roots. The SCN female is left behind. She becomes lemon shaped, as you kind of see towards the top of the root hair. She starts to become so large that she bursts through the root tissue and is exposed on the surface of the root. Now, believe it or not, you are able to see the females on the root, but the size is very small. It's about the size of a period at the end of a sentence or a decimal. So very small, very microscopic, but you can see them with, the un, with your unaided eye if you carefully dig up the roots, and we'll talk about that here in a second. Each of these females that have now burst through the root, they produce about 50 to 100 eggs that are outside the body within like a gelatinous matrix, and then they continue so they got some eggs outside the body. They continue to produce eggs within their body, about 200 or more eggs per SCN or per cyst, or per, per, per female, excuse me. Once that female body fills completely with eggs, she dies and its body begins to form a protective cyst. That, you know that we're familiar with and you'll start to see a color change it's going to go from white to a dark brownish color when the cyst so when it's in that cyst form you know the the eggs do not hatch all at the same time this cyst can survive in the soil for up to 10 years but the crazy part of all of this as you look through that life cycle, it only takes about 24 to 30 days to make this whole cycle happen. So generally within our soybean growing season, we're seeing two to three generations of SCN occurring here in South Dakota. Oftentimes we'll see our symptoms about that end of July, August timeframe, but we do have two to three cycles that have occurred within the growing season. So again, this picture just kind of shows the cyst. If you look at the bottom inset, you're kind of seeing some of the eggs being expelled from eggs and juveniles being expelled from the cyst. And then if you look way to the right, you'll see some of those mobile J2 type um, 
nematodes being released out there. You know, with the nematodes, those J2, they don't move far from the root. So if they're not able to find soybean or a feeding host, you know, they will die. And if they're, so again, if there's not the right host there, they won't continue the life cycle because they need that host to happen. Taking a little closer look at the roots here on the left, you see a soybean root. See that nice large nodule and you see these little kind of white specks out there. Those white specks are those female cysts. Again, very small, very microscopic in size. The nitrogen fixing nodule is about the size of a you know, pencil top eraser versus the size of that you know, period at the end of the sentence. Under magnification, I mean, you can see it very clearly and that's on the right part of your the right side of your screen here. And looking at another size comparison of SCN versus the nitrogen fixing nodule, the blue arrows are pointing towards the nitrogen fixing nodule on a root of the soybean plant. And then we've got the female SCN with the little like white circle dots indicated by the red arrows here. So again, you can see it out in the field. The biggest thing that you have to be careful is when you go to dig those plants, you need to very carefully dig up the plant. You can't just pull the plant out of the field. If you do that, you will knock off those cysts because they're very fragile on there. So if you um, dig them up very carefully, kind of all around the plant, gently remove the soil, you will be able to see that cyst. But not every time, Will a person see the cyst on the plants? If you have a lower number of cysts out in the field, you may, have, you may just pick it up by soil sampling versus looking at the plants. So the looking at plants is not 100% guaranteed for finding SCN. I just wanna put that disclaimer out there. So what are some of the symptoms of SCN? Again, SCN is an, un, you know, it, does its attack and stuff on the roots underground. Oftentimes you don't see things out in the field, but our nice textbook symptoms, if you will, are the stunted plants, the yellowing plants, you know, plants that are open, can open canopied, you know, they're usually kind of clusters within the field. When you would um, dig and take a look at the roots, oftentimes you will find the cysts, but again, it's not always a guarantee with, um, the field, again, some of the wetter spots or those lower spots in the fields, you'll often find where SCN is kind of collected because it can move within the water filaments. SCN, since it's in soil, can move wherever soil moves. So if the wind moves soil around, SCN can move that way. If the a tractor drives through the field or, you know, wildlife or um, geese, you know, whatnot, whatever would walk through and happen to pick up some soil, and if it moves the soil, it can move those SCN all around. And then sometimes our symptoms are no symptoms. We see nothing out in the field. Again, that nice green, you know, perfect stand. You're thinking everything is great, but you just didn't yield as well as you did, you know, a few years ago. So those are some things to kind of pique your interest to take a little closer look for SCN. Again, some of your symptoms are gonna depend on your population of SCN out in the field, your soil type, your soil pH, your soil moisture, soil fertility, and your field history. Like, have you done any rotations and use of SCN resistance out in the field? So sometimes that will all affect what type of symptoms and how much you see out in the field. Taking a look here at some visual symptoms, that had some high SCN numbers attributed to some yield loss. When we looked at a resistant cultivar versus a susceptible cultivar, you know, seeing those high visual symptoms, high SCN numbers, we saw about a 30% bushel loss. In this case, as you see in with this chart, you know, the resistant yielded a little over 60 bushels an acre whereas the susceptible was about a little over 30 bushels an acre. So that's about a 50% yield loss due to SCN. When we take a look at a field where you just don't easily see some of those symptoms, again, pretty uniform stand out there. Everything's nice and green. You're not seeing that roller coaster effect. You're not seeing that stunting, but you're starting to see some 
yield loss when you're looking at the yield monitor or after you harvest the field. So when we looked at this a resistant line versus a susceptible, the resistance had about 50 bushels an acre, whereas the susceptible was about 44 bushels an acre. So that was about a six you know, bushel an acre loss. So, over, so that's about a 12% yield loss that occurred within that field, and that's by not seeing any symptoms out there. So again, really need to take a good look and check that soil and check for SCN. When we take a look at some of our resistant cultivars versus uh, susceptible line, even if we use seed treatment, some of the things that um, can happen is if you look at a susceptible line and look at using the different seed treatments that you know we're supposed to help with the nematode populations, as we look at the susceptible line, there was not much difference between yield and reducing those populations by using that nematicide versus not using it. When we look at the resistant line, the thing that I just wanna kind of really hit home or show is it doesn't cost more to use a resistant line for SCN, still putting on that, you know, the nematicides and whatnot, we did see, you know, yield, dis some yield some yield parameters, but we did see some higher population loss by using that resistant line and with the seed treatments. And so again, resistant variety seed costs the same. So one does not lose anything by planting, you know, a re resistant variety. Instead, over time, this will help reduce that SCN population in the soil. So that's just a quick look or really my promo for really taking a look at those resistant lines. I know years past, those resistant lines had a bad rap that they caused a yield drag and we are just not seeing that or finding that in today's resistance line. So again, it's an easy method if you think you have SCN or start to see SCN out in the field, utilize those resistance to help reduce those numbers over time because it's much easier to manage a low yielding SCN population than trying to manage where those numbers are high and out of hand. The problem with SCN, and when you're out looking at the field, is that it can be confused with a number of different things, like nutrient deficiency, like iron chlorosis, um, water logging of the soil, you know, some salt to toxicities, drought, soil compaction, herbicide toxicities, and some other diseases. So again, it's not always easy to tell by the above ground symptoms alone. We need to look underground and check that soil. You know, it's very important that soybean growers double check, you know, a sample um, for SCN. So how do we sample? Well, the best time of year to sample for soybean cyst nematode is ideally after the soybean harvest or corn harvest would occur, but you can send samples and take samples any time of year as long as the ground is not frozen or completely saturated. So we don't want like a wet sopping soil to pull samples from. That wouldn't give us a good read. Um, highest levels are gonna be after that corn or soybean harvest in the fall. Even if you have to do it right before harvest, that would work too. It does not take much, you know, about a pint of soil. And I'll kind of show you a recommending um, soil sampling procedure here. But the wonderful thing for South Dakota soybean growers is the South Dakota Soybean Research and Promotion Council is currently underwriting the cost for so SCN um, sampling, provided you're a South Dakota soybean grower. And if you send it into the SDSU Plant Diagnostic Clinic, you'll be able to get your samples ran for free and they'll give you that um, report as to what they're finding in the samples that you submit. So that is a great deal for our South Dakota soybean growers. When you go for um, SCN soil sampling, ideally we'd recommend that you would break up your field into 10 to 20 acre sections. Within that 10 to 20 acre section, we'd like you to collect about 20 um, soil cores in a zigzag pattern. So, you know, a soil core is about quarter cup of soil because you're only going in about the top six inches. 
top six to eight inches to pull for SCN. Um, so as you're going in that zigzag pattern, as you kind of see in the screen here, you're going to collect about 20 samples. You're going to put that in like one bucket or ice cream bucket. You're going to mix that together. And then you're only, only going to take about a pint of that and put that in that sampling bag to send up to SDSU for diagnosis there. Um, when you're sampling, we also encourage you to, you can do some spot or target samples. So um, pay special attention to the low areas of the field, field that uh, was lower yielding, if you had some high pH, you know, the field entrances, if there's any um, fences around the area, pay attention to that just because, like I said, SCN can move anywhere that soil can move. So I encourage that. Again, send those samples to the diagnostic clinic for review and they will get that report. So when you work with SCN, you know, the biggest step for management is you want a soil test. Soil test if you've never had SCN. Soil test if you have. Because you want to, the only way you can work with this pest is to know if you have it. So if you've not soil sampled in the past, I encourage you to do so. You kind of get a base read on your field and then check it every couple of years. If you have SCN, it'd be a great way to see if what you're doing is working, if you're actually seeing a reduction in numbers, because the last thing we want is to start seeing your numbers go up the other way. So um, the next part here for managing and working with SCN is you want to practice crop rotation. You want to rotate away from soybean to what we call a non-host crop. They prevent the SCN from forming or from increasing within the soil, but also reduces the SCN numbers due to the lack of SCN that are able to feed, so they're not able to continue that life cycle. So some of those non-host crops are corn, and the great thing with corn is if you do soybeans and then you would plant corn, you're gonna see the highest level, or we've observed the highest level of mortality for those SCN after you plant corn. So that helps get rid of a lot of that SCN out there. Um, you could plant small, small grains, sunflowers, flax, canola, and alfalfa, to just name a few for those non-host crops. If you have a high population, so, we're looking at over 12,000 eggs per 100 cc's. If you're looking at that 12,000 eggs or more, recommend a longer rotation. So a crop like alfalfa is a great one to help break down and reduce those numbers. The next part of management for SCN would be to start planting if you're not already doing so and rotating and to using resistant varieties. You know, there's resistance with the PI88788, with many different ones there, and then there's some peaking. So again, and then you'd want to rotate within your resistance cultivars for different SCN gene sources. You don't want to use the same source year after year because the SCN can start to overtake that resistance and you're going to start to see your numbers going up, and we don't want to see that. The other part of managing for SCN, you know, I say is good agronomic practices. You want to maintain fertility, you know, proper drainage out in the field, and also weed control. Weed control is a big one because there are a couple of weeds that are known as an alternative host for SCN, such as pennycrest and henbit. So you want to control them. And then again, if you do have high SCN populations, you know, encourage the use of a nematicide seed treatment. There's um, a few different ones out there. The newer ones are Solatro and Evio, but there is Alivio, Clariva, and Evicta complete beans for use. So again, also you can incorporate that nematicide seed treatment. But as we talked about, you know, really take a look at those resistant varieties, because that's going to give you the biggest bang for a little bit of expense, because they cost the same as the susceptible 
varieties and cultivars out there. So really take a look at that. And then if you need to also in incorporate a nematicide, you know, I would encourage you to do that. For more information or to really learn a little bit more about SCN, you know, I encourage you to visit the SCN Coalition. You know, they'll talk about more, more about testing and some of the different recommendations and some of the different management styles. So it's a great network and place to visit if you've, if you're not familiar with that. Again, you know, a new generation of SCN is born every 24 to 30 days. And I like to say, if that soil test or that report comes back, even if it shows one cyst, now is the time to start managing it. Because unfortunately, we can never completely eliminate that from the soil. We just want to maintain and reduce the numbers. So with that, just want to acknowledge the South Dakota Soybean Research and Promotion Council for the funding of the different projects that we've worked with, the Ag Experiment Station, the different agricultural industries, and our on-farm cooperators. And I want to leave you with my contact information. I am a plant pathology field specialist located in the Sioux Falls Regional Extension Center. So if you have any questions, feel free to call in, drop by, or send an email.